Well, I really want to talk about outposts. Um, and, and really we talk about this journey with customers is um, this, this adoption continues to grow. So a site was uh, noted back in 2018 by the IDG cloud, and it was a cloud computing study uh, that was really conducted to measure uh, cloud computing tenants across different technology decision makers. And really what it uh, concluded was, you know, they wanted to look at usage and plans across various and, you know, uh, cloud services and what those specific deployment models uh, were with the type of investments, the business drivers and the impact on what it had on that overall business strategy. And what it found was surprising, it, it, it found that really 73% of organizations have at least one application or a portion of their computing infrastructure um, already in the cloud. Uh, and the 17% um, of organizations basically plan to do so within the next 12 months. So the question we come down to is, so, so what is causing the delay in cloud adoption, right? So many customers are moving to the cloud. The numbers are undeniable. Um, again, they've been cited by independent studies uh, across different types of uh, analysts. And again, so what's the biggest thing here? Why do applications remain on-prem? Now, there's a couple of reasons, but first is, you know, number one is there are two really main reasons of why there is some hesitation uh, and constraint when it talks about moving to the cloud. The first one is really um, low latency requirements. So some applications, specifically business critical applications, are very sensitive to latency. And um, th that application latency, it, it tends to vary. Um, and what we need to do is, you know, you say, well, you need to have applications to run on-prem to respond to events uh, within an extremely small millisecond latency in order to ensure that smooth and predictable operations that customers are already accustomed to using. So they kind of already know on-prem kind of how their application is going to respond. So when you talk about customers moving to the cloud, you know, there's some hesitation there with regards to some of these legacy applications that are very sensitive to latency. It could be a monolithic application that can't be moved. Um, you know, I've definitely heard a couple of things such as, all right, so I've got this application. There's too many dependencies. It can't be moved to the cloud. We can't break it up to a microservices architecture. It's got to stay the way it is. Um, you know, that's definitely one reason. The second thing, of course, is local data processing and data integrity needs. And really, this has really been an exponential increase. Uh, you know, there's been an exponential increase in data over the last couple of years, and that's being generated by users and dev end user devices. Uh, and that data integrity is really a key concern in locations that are bandwidth constrained. Um, so you've got data intensive workloads collected and t processed tons of data. We're talking about terabytes of data per day. Um, and the transmission of this volume uh, to be able to move this to the cloud is, is it's really wasteful and it becomes very, very expensive for some customers. Um, so we talk about transmitting message or we talk about data streams over long distances of internet connections that can really lead to packet loss and that packet loss really results in um, a data integrity problems. So really we start getting into this uh, kind of this circular loop of, you know, conversations we talk with customers really. So um, application sensitive that are very late, you know, latency uh, sensitive. And then of course a massive amount of local data processing. I can't move this to the cloud. All right, not a problem. So we'll talk about that a little bit more in detail. We'll talk about what some customers are doing. Um, another customer, you know, a real challenge that customers are having um, is that really is that the IT challenge is things like procurement. Uh, provisioning cycles are very long and complex, typically about six months to get servers deployed. Um, there's multiple vendors to procure. And then the biggest question is, is, you know, we're operating on premise, you know, how can we bring efficiency and consolidation and procurement installation, maintenance, and things like that. Um, and then of course, the, 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 the significant overhead to being able to patch, manage, upgrade those uh, on-prem is very complex and you have to work across many types of co compatibility matrices. Um, I can tell you that when I first started out in, the, in, my, in my career, I think I worked for uh, you know, one of the big you know, PC or the computer manufacturers um, back in 1997. You know, we were racking and stacking servers and it would take us months and you know, even up to a couple years ago, I would look at some customer server deployment timeframe and it would be from the time for them to deploy a virtual machine uh, was about 30 days for them to deploy a physical server was about 90 days. Uh, so we talk about some challenges that has, and especially when it comes to the developers, is really the developers don't care. They, they really just want to be able to use, um, you know, they want to be able to use APIs. They want to build on tools. 
they want to be able to build apps. And that's the biggest thing. So it really starts to, you know, have IT infrastructure and developers really start to pull back that pace of innovation because the pace of innovation lags because you can't get infrastructure up and running fast enough for those developers to accelerate and achieve velocity. So here we kind of have this power struggle between two types of uh, organization, two types of entities within your organization. And really customers want to be able to have ultimately that same experience across, you know, on prem and they want to have that in the cloud. They want to be able to have the same operating consistency. They want to use the same services, uh, the same APIs, the same tools for automation. They want to use their deployment pipelines and their common, they, they want to use their services control. Um, and the, really what they want to do is they want to be able to do that uh, at the same pace of innovation as if it's in the cloud. So where we, where, where, where do we go from here? That's kind of been a struggle. So it's either been on cloud, you know, move to the cloud or, you know, basically stay on prem. So when Outpost was released, Outpost uh, was a way for us to be able to bring the cloud to you. So if for customers with those type of requirements, we, that's where we designed Outpost. Um, and really I'll be able to show you really more about it. Um, Outpost really enable you to really, you know, develop once and deploy in the cloud uh, or on-prem without really even having to rewrite your applications. Uh, that's a big benefit here. So with Outpost is that you have the same hardware, same software infrastructure, and a consistent set of services really across uh, different tool sets, um, both across your AWS cloud and on-prem environments. And you really want to be able to build that to have an ability to have a basically a, a run modern cloud native applications anywhere. And Outpost really does address that. And what they are is it's really, it's a fully managed and supported by AWS. It automatically manages the updates uh, and really it basically allows you to just kind of say, all right, so I want to be able to operate in the cloud, but I want to have that ability to kind of have that ability to have it on-prem. Oh, and by the way, I need to be able to have a single pane of glass to be able to provide consistent tooling across APIs and across different regions. And the great thing about hybrid architectures and hybrid environments, you know, again, is that we bring outposts on-prem and really what this looks like is Outpost is really, it comes in a 42U rack form. It's already fully assembled. It's ready to be rolled in position. Uh, we basically already build this for you. We bring this to your on-prem data center. Um, and really what it does is it really shows up your data center. And essentially all you do is you really just simply just roll it in and plug the power in and plug the network in and you're ready to rock and roll. Um, and one of the great things about it is that it comes with a centralized redundant power conversion uh, unit it also comes with DC power distribution. It has redundant active components uh, such as switches and spare capacity. So there's a lot of built-in redundancy already built into this. And we'll kind of be able to kind of peel back the layer a little bit and we'll take a look inside to see really what that looks like a little bit more in depth. Uh, so it's a great way for AWS to kind of bring some of that innovation and technology about how we have building uh, some of these and with inside of our data centers, be able to bring these to you. And really, if we kind of peel this back a little bit, we start to look at this typical to 42U rack. Basically, here's a three-dimensional picture of this. So at the very top, you have your patch panels and either 1, 10, 40, or 100 gig network fiber. You even have uplink options as well. Um, in the middle tier, you have your network switches. Uh, and of course, there's a lot of redundancy built in because there's dual network switches. Uh, you also have a layer of hosts. And again, there's redundancy built in here. And if you look to the right, you know, we talk about power supply. Um, we have up to a five uh, KVA, up to a 15 KVA uh, power supply. Now you see basically there's one uh, power supply here um, and there's basically, there's a power feed, but actually there's two power feeds uh, basically here. So you have two plugs that you plug in here, although it's only showing one, uh, there is redundancy with dual sets of power. So you do have that ability to make sure that if one power supply fails, uh, the whole entire rack doesn't lose power. Um, and if you basically rack these things on prem before, um, you know of the importance, of course, of having uh, redundancy built in. Because if one piece of hardware fails, you want to make sure you have it pick up and make sure it, that you don't have the whole rack fail. So great. Um, what are the supported countries uh, route post is available in? Uh, you can get this within any one of the countries. Uh, it's currently available to be in, in the US and all EU countries, including Switzerland, Norway, Japan. Uh, and we're going to be adding more countries. Uh, starting this quarter, so stay tuned. But if you're in any one of these countries, you definitely can, of course, get an outpost and get it installed in your local data center. So the supported region, so if I get an outpost, the next question is, all right, so is it supported in my specific region? You can look at the supported regions list here. Um, 
So again, a, additional regions are gonna be rolled out later this quarter. So if you pick any region that's gonna be connected to your environment, uh, specifically depending upon your requirement. So for example, if um, you have a resource that's part of the EU Central or basically it's all in Dublin, you can run all your resources out of EU Central One uh, and you can establish connection uh, to EU Central for shared resource access. So it's another really great tool for you to be able to use, to be able to use this within inside of your region. Uh, it's important to note that there are uh, two types of variants when it comes to outposts. Um, there's native AWS, and of course, native AWS uh, just simply allows you to use the same APIs, same control plane uh, that you use in AWS, um, but allows you to build and run your applications and do it on-prem, which is really cool. So let's just say, for example, you're running EC2 with EBS, uh, you're running RDS, um, let's say you're running relational database, you're running containers, you wanna run uh, Kubernetes, uh, run EMR, which is like a Hadoop, which is Elastic MapReduce, um, you wanna run load balancers, all of that can be done within the native AWS version of Outpost. Um, another version of the Outpost is gonna be VMware Cloud on AWS. So for those customers who are running VMware Cloud, or if in fact, if they want to run VMware Cloud on AWS locally, uh, you can basically use Outposts and you can use the same VMware control plane uh, that allows you to use those VMware APIs that you can run on-prem. Um, the biggest thing here, of course, is that if in fact, if you're already running uh, VMware SDBC on-prem, so if you're running things like HCX, um, NSX, NSXT, uh, basically, or vSphere, you can basically use VMware Cloud on AWS to use Outpost as a way to extend your logical data network. And you can basically vMotion uh, resources from basically from on-prem and Outpost, which is really cool because that was something it was really hard to do before. Um, and that VMware, ver that VMware Cloud on AWS gives you that ability to do the vMotion and be able to extend that as a logical network. So you have two different forms you can choose. So really, what does it really address? Um, it really addresses this, the ability for you to increase that productivity and innovation. So it really goes back to, all right, so I wanna use the same development, I wanna use the same deployment, I wanna use the same operational efficiencies that I've basically been running on-prem for the longest time, and I wanna run those on-prem, but in AWS. And Outpost gives you that ability to uh, extend those cloud-like capabilities from your on-prem or your colo facility um, you really just kind of think of it as um, it's a rack that just simply moved, <laughs> moved from an AWS region data center and it was simply placed in your own data center, um, connected to your network uh, using things like Direct Connect, VPN, you can use the same APIs. The, the elegance of this is that, again, it's simplification uh, and um, basically um, standardization. You really can use this to um, achieve or basically manage local compute, storage, uh, and really be able to use those same things you've been inherently used to doing. Um, another great thing about this is that it's really designed um, for use within an AWS region so that it's really, the way to think of it is, you know, you want to think about, um, you know, you're automatically, you know, how, what about my patch strategy? What does that look like? Um, you know, you can think of it as, you know, you want to have it manage as part of your region. Um, you want to really want to think about being able to remove um, the need for customers to manage additional infrastructure. Um, you really can access Outpost capacity as you would capacity within the AWS cloud. And that's the great thing about it because it helps you uh, achieve velocity, helps developers innovate because you can really use those resources as disposable. So if I think about it, like being able to use on-prem, what are some services I could use on-prem with hybrid cloud? Hmm. So, so a lot of the same services that you're currently using. So like say, for example, I wanna use the Intel powered EC2 instance. I wanna be able to use my um, instance without local storage. Uh, you can use those with your general purpose and those instances provide a, a simple, you know, uh, balance of compute, memory, and network. You want to be able to use compute optimized workloads for uh, workloads that are very compute intensive. And ultimately what they do is they really help deliver the most cost effective and high performance at a very low price per, per, per compute ratio. So whether you have a variant workload across whether it's general purpose, compute, 
memory optimized. Um, let's say, for example, you have an application that are very memory intensive, so you need to be able to use memory intensive or memory optimized instances. Or if you have an application that is graphic, uh, graphic intensive. So if you need to basically use a, um, a specific FPGA, so that way you're really getting down to the actual physical process or portion of it. Uh, or if in fact, if you need to do things such as machine learning inference or for applications like adding metadata to image and object detection, or whether it's um, looking at or enabling speech recognition or language translation, um, you can really use these types of um, instances in Outpost that it gives you the ability to build these without having to build out the additional infrastructure. Or let's say you have IO intensive applications such as a NoSQL type of database or if in fact, if you're running any type of distributed file system. So again, whatever your workload needs to be, whatever the instance it matches on or whatever instance you need to run it on, you can run this really essentially across different instances with inside Outpost. And that's the great thing about it is that it really brings those cloud-like abilities from the cloud on-prem to give you that low latency and basically best price, best bang for the buck, so to speak. All right, so got a couple of different figures here. We talk about being able to choose a pre-validated catalog from Outpost configurations. So essentially what you could do is you could choose from a range of pre-validated Outpost configurations um, and a different mix of EC2 and EBS capacity that really design are really designed to, to meet a variety of different application needs. And the, the great thing about this is that you can really, you know, you can contact us to create a customized configuration um, designed specifically for your application needs. And that's the great thing is that it really can be pre-configured specifically for you and custom tailored for your specific use cases. Another great thing here is that we talk about being able to use these services to run them locally. Um, so if we think about being able to use things like elastic container services or you know, basically Amazon Elastic Container or uh, even using things like, you know, our native Kubernetes services for things like containers, EMR for big data, or if you're looking for relational database services for, uh, for databases to run locally on Outpost. And, and that's the great thing about it is that you could use these to run these services on-prem. So again, if you're looking for things like, you know, such as S3 DynamoDB, you could use a public endpoint and then you could use that public endpoint to connect privately using VPN. And we'll get into a couple different network configurations about kind of how that looks in a second, but really, you know, really the breadth of services that be able to give you that ability to run these things locally is extremely powerful for some customers with those type of application requirements. Just a couple of uh, kind of a quick advertisement really quick. We're talking about things that are in preview. So for some customers that are asking the questions such as, oh, I wanna be able to run RDS, MySQL, Postgres. Uh, these are things that are gonna basically, these are on our roadmap. These are kind of things that are gonna be coming uh, to Outpost very, very soon. Uh, these are already out in the roadmap. Uh, so if you're looking at things such as, I wanna be able to do fully managed databases, I wanna be able to use RDS on the cloud. Again, if you wanna be able to use these, um, think about being able to use things like um, hybrid cloud for hybrid deployments with DR capabilities back into the AWS region. That was a customer asked that we had um, had a couple customers asking for quite some time. Now that we put that on the roadmap, um, it's really powerful to use. Or if we're looking at things such as re-replica bursting to RDS in the cloud or long-term archival in S3 to the cloud. So these are a couple of things in the preview. Again, the list is just getting uh, longer and longer of things that are coming to Outpost. So a couple of the things also coming out as well is looking able to build the store object data uh, on-prem using that S3 API. You can store that data basically, um, store that data within S3. Applications running within Outpost are gonna be able to access uh, S3 within specific regions. Uh, and again, of course, S3 for Outpost is gonna provide you with that additional flexibility um, to, and additional options to control whether your data is stored locally or in a region. So that's also really, really cool that customers have been looking for and asking for. Uh, being able to have S3 on-prem, oh, wow, that's awesome. Again, uh, you know, really is that when we're talking about being able to Amazon, use the Amazon tool sets, um, they really work well because existing things like all your API calls are gonna automatically be logged via things like CloudTrail. Existing CloudFormation templates are also going to work. Um, you can use tools such as CloudFormation, CloudWatch, CloudTrail, and all these others to essentially run and manage um, all the existing applications uh, as they are in the cloud, and they are in the cloud. You can use these to run these on-prem just as they're used in, basically in your workloads that are running in your VPCs today. Uh, also, it's also worth noting is that they are also gonna have the same security control such as IAM permissions. 
um, VP security groups and access control lists, which gives you that fine grain access control list. And also you can also use AWS tools running um, in the region such as CloudFormation, uh, CloudWatch, CloudTrail, uh, even Beanstalk, Cloud9 and others, even to be able to use those inside your outposts uh, the way that you are thinking of today. So again, think of it as basically having on, you know, having the cloud brought to your on-prem data center and then being able to still use those tool sets all the way across, whether they're in the cloud or on-prem, which is really powerful and that's what really Outposts is really intended to do. Uh, we look at being able to seamlessly extend your regional VPC. All right, so as a networking guy, how do I basically look at this and how would I begin to think about bringing outposts into my environment? What do I need to do? Well, just like you have in your AWS region, you've got two availability zones, you've got your VPC built out, you have your subnets for your resources. So just as the control plane within your public region, you can access a wide range of different AWS services uh, locally or in your outposts uh, within your public, uh, using public endpoints or using a private VPN. Um, and then those instances, the outposts can securely talk to other instances in your VPC through your private IP addressing. So if you use interface endpoints uh, or if you're basically using private endpoints used by private link, you could use those to access uh, all of those regional services such as DynamoDB, S3 in your private VPC environment. Uh, and really the great benefit here is that they're all using regional public endpoints. Um, so that's a really cool feature here. Oh, so again, so if I wanted to be able to use S3, again, I mean, be able to use my public inter uh, my interface. So if I'm using Dynamo or S3, again, all I have to do is just use my, uh, my private link or basically use those uh, private IP addresses uh, in Elastic inter or those interface endpoints. Really how to get started with uh, Outpost. Outpost is really essentially very easy. Um, really what you do, you go into the console, you simply select your compute and storage capacity, which is gonna be your order. Um, and then what we'll do is we'll then be able to schedule a delivery to have those outposts delivered. Um, and then we'll also help you install those outposts as well. And then third, well, you just simply just turn it on and then you start basically with managing those through the AWS console using AWS APIs and essentially you can run and even run those resources locally. So really you think of it as a, as a real way of being able to just simply just easily integrate with what you're currently using in AWS and you can even bring those now into uh, on-prem data centers using those same APIs across the spectrum. Uh, just a couple of prerequisites. Again, you know, you got to have space in the data center floor. You've got to have the be able to necessary to be able to have the necessary power. Um, and the positioning is basically in the data center is going to be correct. Um, you've got to also make sure when it comes to your network connection, you have a direct connect or you have a public fifth. Um, or if in fact you have an internet connection via an ISP, you can also do a VPN connection as well. Enterprise support is definitely required to have uh, to outposts as well. Uh, it just gives you that extra layer of support. So if you have any questions, you can also reach out to your technical account manager. You also have a concierge when it comes to enterprise support, but that gives you the ability to basically just ensure that make sure everything is in place. And if you have any questions, and if you need to have a custom solution architect or a network architect, whichever you have that with enterprise support. So again, is that you've selected your compute capacity, already comes for the fully assembled, pretty already configured, um, pre-configured or val validated SKUs, uh, mix of different EC2 instances, volumes. Again, these are custom tailored specifically to your environment. So when you place an order for these, um, you're placing an order specifically for what your specific needs are. Every customer will be different. You can choose from a small configuration all the way up to, you know, 2.7 Tebby bits or basically GP2 volumes that can scale hundreds of racks within an outpost. Um, and that's a great, a great ability too. Uh, again, we talked about being able to deliver that within a few weeks based on your preferred delivery window. Multiple racks can be configured at the site uh, within a single pool of capacity. And here is a quick, quick screenshot of what it looks like when you begin to start to launch and run those resources locally is that here from your AWS console, you now have a feature within outpost that you can now start to see those resources and you can then begin to manage those. And then here's an example of how you would essentially launch the resource and you can take an action, launch your instance, create a subnet, create your VPC. So just being able to just do these um, on-prem is, is just really been able to be um, really empowering for a lot of customers with those requirement needs where they can't run those in the cloud. So this is a really great feature. 
we talk about being able to use things like um, outposts and we want to talk about, um, you know, here as we'll talk about launching an instance. Launching an instance is the same way. Again, how it runs in AWS, you continue to run it it's the same way. Again, it's a seamless integration. Um, I'm going to move ahead really quick here and talk about security and responsibility. Um, really, we're talking about security and responsibility. Again, is that Outpost is still has an, it's under a different, it's just an updated shared responsibility model. So really, AWS is responsible for protecting um, the Outpost infrastructure, similar to how we do our infrastructure in the cloud today. But customers are ultimately going to be responsible for securing their applications and running those Outposts. So again, if you've got very strict uh, data center entry requirements and making sure that, you know, the customers are also going to be responsible for the physical security of those outpost racks, just like you are in your current data center today. Um, you want to make sure that, of course, those racks are locked and make sure, you know, you have proper keys and things like that. Um, you know, really, it's another integration within your existing data center. So you just think of it that way. Uh, it's also got built in tamper detection uh, locks as well. You can also have data out with outposts that's going to be encrypted. Uh, and you can even have removable, disturbable hardware with security key in each server. So if you need to apply to any type of ISO uh, or DOD type of requirements when it comes to data destruction, you can also follow those things as well. Again, physical security of that outpost isolation is the customer's responsibility. There are a lot of partners uh, that will really kind of can also help complement you in there as well. Um, and I'm almost wrapped up here. I'm almost at the top of my time. So there's a wide range of consulting partners. Many of these, many customers are already familiar with. These partners have deep expertise in helping businesses migrate those applications to the cloud. So we've got consulting partners, many of whom you, uh, many customers are already familiar with. We have technology partners. Uh, and these are really designed to help uh, basically enable customers when it comes to products that are integrated within AWS uh, and also integrated with Outposts and really determining really kind of what's going to be the right fit and then how they can really kind of make sure that that solution can really help them achieve or basically break through certain problems that they may have. Um, and they're really integrated well. Um, sometimes you really just need to just um, kind of evaluate and test some of these applications yourselves. Um, and you can also reach out to some of our technology partners as well. Again, I encourage you to you know, check out more um, on AWS website when it comes to outposts. Again, this topic is much more detailed than what I can get through in about 30 minutes. So I'll definitely yield back my time. It looks like I'm about the, the basically two minutes over for the next speaker. But again, I can't thank Ron for enough for setting this up. And again, if you have any questions, feel free to reach out to me on LinkedIn or through my email address, which will be posted after the summit.